Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Factory Reset Podcast. My name is Tommy and this podcast is an attempt to help us get serious about how Jesus taught his disciples to live. The last three episodes have been about greed and how Jesus teaches us to use resources. This episode is about how miraculous it is when someone who is wealthy actually responds to what Jesus is saying to us. Imagine a camel and a human being standing next to each other about five feet apart. And in front of them is a tall, solid steel wall. And on the other side of that wall is the kingdom of God. Both the camel and the human being are standing outside of it. And they're separated by a fence that comes out from the wall. Right in front of the camel, there in the wall, is a tiny little hole just big enough to pass some string through. It's maybe about the size of a sesame seed. You wouldn't even see it if you were standing a few feet away from the wall. But in front of the human being, there's a wide open doorway, the entrance to the kingdom of God. It's a normal sized doorway. It's more than big enough for that person to easily pass through it. And there's nothing standing in their way. Now, the only way for that camel to get on the other side of that wall and into the kingdom is to go through that tiny little sesame seed sized hole in front of it. So it's not looking good for the camel. It weighs 1800 pounds. It's over six feet tall. So it's ridiculous to even ask if it can get through that hole if it charges into the wall in an attempt to squeeze through somehow it's just going to slam into the steel repeatedly until it knocks itself out there might as well not even be a hole in the wall there and yet jesus says that if that human being standing in front of that open door if that person is wealthy in this life then it's going to be harder for them to go through that wide open doorway than for that camel to somehow force itself through that tiny hole. The camel has a better chance of getting into the kingdom. And what's maddening about this is that there is nothing holding that wealthy person back but themselves. Back in 2017, a good friend of mine and I sat down together hoping to reconcile and find some common ground on the gospel. I had been going through a very exciting but also a very unsettling shift in my perspective. And I had come to the, con to the conclusion that I and my Reformed evangelical friends, including this friend, were badly misled and in serious danger. And one of the things that I was most concerned about was this issue of greed and wealth. In my opinion, my Christian friends and I were not even trying to obey some of the basic things that Jesus taught. And I was trying to persuade my friends that we really needed to make some big changes. And I was thinking specifically about what Jesus says about selling possessions and giving to the needy and not accumulating wealth for ourselves. Additionally, I realized that we were addicted to a certain quality of life that we took for granted, that we were addicted to certain entertaining and comforting perks of living in America. Unfortunately, I didn't communicate the, the message I was trying to bring with the kind of humility and meekness that was really required. And I wish I could do some of those conversations over. But part of the reason... I was struggling was that I was frustrated. Some people in my church were willing to talk to me and to kind of put up with me for a while, but it was like I was just being tolerated. It seemed like nobody was really ready to think seriously about these things and make some, you know, some practical changes. Anyway, so this good friend of mine who I was now meeting with, he was one of the people that I had really tried to persuade, but it was a futile effort. Both, both my attempts to convince him 
and his attempts to reel me in and to get me to calm down about these things. And now it had been some time since we had last spoken and we were getting together again to see if maybe somehow we could get somewhere. And the issue of materialism and greed came up. The things Jesus said about the rich and the poor and what to do with money. And again, we didn't see eye to eye on it. He didn't share my concern. And finally, he said something to me that really stuck with me. He said, It's easy for you to say these things, Tommy, because you have nothing. I thought about what he said quite a bit over the following days and weeks, and it occurred to me that, maybe without realizing it, in saying that, he was confirming something Jesus said about this whole issue. Jesus said, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why did my friend think it was easier for me to just say these things Jesus said than it was for other people in our community? Well, according to him, it was because I had nothing. Nothing to lose. No nice big house, no summer getaway, no expensive cars, no big retirement fund that I was counting on. I didn't have a bunch of kids growing up in America who had certain expectations for what they would find under the tree at Christmas or what they would receive on their birthdays or what kind of school they would go to. I didn't have a garage or a basement full of gear and gadgets and fun stuff to make life more interesting and enjoyable for me. And so, yeah, maybe I did have an easier time embracing some of these radical things Jesus said. Maybe if I had acquired those kind of things, I wouldn't have been so willing to embrace what he said and and just say it. And I I was going to try for the American dream. A few years prior to this, I had begun trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to make a a lot more money than I'm making right now? How am I going to support a family? And at one point I I began, and and there's nothing wrong with trying to support a family, but I was going to, you know, try to provide a certain quality of life for a wife and and several kids. And at one point, I began uh, talking to a friend, a friend of my family who had made a lot of money as a stockbroker, and he was starting to coach me a bit on, on how to make money in the stock market. But then my marriage fell apart, and my life fell apart. Everything came to a halt. And I ended up living in a basement bedroom in a friend's house. So my plans didn't work out, obviously. But I wonder, what what if if that hadn't happened to me? What if I had kept kept going the way I was going? What if I had acquired the kind of wealth that I was going to try to get? What if I'd ended up making a hundred grand a year or more? What if I'd ended up with a great house in a great area with a wife and kids who expected a certain a certain kind of life. Maybe then I, I wouldn't have been able to just say what Jesus said because I wouldn't have been willing to just do what Jesus said. I wouldn't have been willing to part with my comfortable and luxurious lifestyle. Now it's not true that I had nothing, by the way. I, I was not I was not wealthy compared to a lot of the people in my church family. But there were a lot of people around the world who would have gladly traded places with me. I had more money than I needed to provide for my needs. I had a reliable vehicle. I had unlimited access to drinkable water. I had far more clothing than I needed. I had access to unlimited food. I had a warm and comfortable bed to sleep in and a room to live in. My needs were thoroughly met and then some. And today I still have more money than is required to meet my needs. And I regularly face the temptation to purchase things that I don't need, and I have to be careful what I do with my resources. You know, Jesus actually went a lot further than saying that it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom. He says it's impossible. It's impossible. 
He said that it is more difficult for a wealthy person to get into God's kingdom than it is for an enormous four-legged animal to go through that little hole at the end of a needle. Well, obviously, it's impossible for an animal that big to go through that hole. And yet it's harder than that for wealthy people to get into the kingdom. It's literally a miracle when it happens. And I realize it's a miracle when anyone is saved, of course, but it seems that Jesus is saying that for the rich, this is especially unusual. And maybe that's because of the magnitude of the miracle that must take place in the heart of a wealthy person in order for them to be willing to do what Jesus calls them to do. And by the way, when Jesus says that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God and that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, he is not playing some kind of mind game with us. He's not just trying to get us to despair and realize that there's nothing that we can do and that we therefore need to only trust in the saving work of the cross and not in anything we do. No, that's not the point. When Jesus says that it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom, what he means is that it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom. We rich people really are at a disadvantage. Actually, Jesus is speaking plainly here, and he means just what he says. But many of us have learned to sort of pass right over the plain text here, assuming it can't possibly mean just what it says, and we learn to read things into it that aren't really there. And we've got to stop reading between the lines of Jesus' teachings and missing what it says, and we need to read what the words actually say. Something truly miraculous must happen in the life of a rich person in order for them to get into the kingdom. They must give up all they possess in a certain way. They must cease to accumulate for themselves and must trust God with their future. They must learn to love their neighbor as they love themselves, and that's going to mean voluntarily, in obedience to Jesus, making dramatic changes in how they live and how they use their wealth. And it's partially because they are rich that the necessary changes will be so dramatic like night and day. But someone who owns nothing or who doesn't make very much money, they might, they may not be as offended by what Jesus says as someone who has as much to lose in this world as a rich person. The change in their lifestyle may not be as dramatic. And most wealthy people simply will not do it. It's not that they can't. It's that they won't. It's impossible. It's impossible for it to happen if we are left to our own devices, that is. But the miracle can happen. What is impossible with man is possible with God. It's just as miraculous when a rich person repents as the raising of a dead person or the restoration of sight to a, a person born blind. Sometimes people will, who are skeptical about Christianity, they'll, they'll scoff at some of the miracles recorded in the Gospels. They think it's too amazing to be true. It couldn't have really happened. You know, people don't walk on water. Blind people don't just see again. Paralyzed people can't be made able to walk just by someone commanding them to walk. Come on. That kind of stuff doesn't happen in the real world. But you know, there are a few events that are recorded in the Gospels in the book of Acts that may be even more miraculous than those kind of things, even more unbelievable, if we understand what's really happening there. Let me just read one to you, a very short one. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. 
And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. What? I, 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 did that? Could this possibly have happened? Wow, walking on water is one thing. That's amazing. But a wealthy man who's got it made, who's got financial security for the rest of his life, gets up and just leaves it all behind to follow the Messiah? Wow. I, I, I don't know about you, but I've never seen something like that. I've never seen it. Let me read you another miracle. This is perhaps one of the greatest miracles recorded in the whole Bible. It's easier for that camel to get through that tiny hole to the other side of that wall than it is for what you are about to hear to occur. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Behold the power of the living God. When was the last time you witnessed something like that happen? I really think that miraculous healings, physical healings, are more common than this kind of miracle, especially in a place like the United States. Parting the Red Sea, that is amazing. But for God to bring a wealthy man or woman to a place where they willingly listen to Jesus on this issue, I think that's in another category of the miraculous. Now notice what had to happen before Jesus pronounced salvation over Zacchaeus. Jesus didn't say salvation has come to this house when Zacchaeus climbed the tree or when he welcomed him into his house. No being drawn to Jesus and even and interested in him and even having affection for him, that's not enough. I imagine Zacchaeus wrestled in his soul that day. He had no doubt heard about all that Jesus had been teaching about greed and what to do with wealth. At some point, he came to a place of obedient faith that he was now willing to do what Jesus had been saying. He saw that the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. It's worth selling everything we have so that we can go and buy that field. There aren't very many accounts in the Gospels of rich people actually responding to what Jesus had been saying. And there aren't many of them today, as far as I know. But here was one precious rich man who got the heart of Jesus on this issue and he did something about it. He responded. And then Jesus pronounces salvation. And Zacchaeus was justified by his faith that he became ready and willing to follow Jesus no matter the cost. That's faith. He was not justified by the works of the law, the Mosaic law. His circumcision didn't matter. His being a bi biological descendant of Abraham, that didn't matter. God can raise up that kind of child of Abraham from a rock if he wants to. No, what made Zacchaeus a son of Abraham in the way that matters was his obedient faith in the Messiah. He responded to Jesus the way Abraham responded to God. 
He was ready to go all in. And that's what we need also. When Zacchaeus makes his announcement, Jesus does not say to him, now Zacchaeus, you took me too literally there. I, I, I don't, you don't actually have to do this to, to, to be saved. All you have to do is trust in something that I'm going to do for you. No, Jesus meant exactly what he had been saying about how hard it is for the rich. And his words still mean for us just what they meant for those who actually heard him say it. Yes, Jesus had to die for us to be saved. It's not our salvation is not a matter of just, you know, uh, doing something in obedience. There's nothing irreconcilable about his atoning death with what's happening in this passage. The problem happens when we understand the atonement in the wrong way. Jesus' death is not this legal deal. It's not a legal transaction that removes from us the need to respond to him in the kind of way Zacchaeus did in order to be saved. But his death is the ransom and the sacrifice he needed to make to cause us to respond to him like Zacchaeus did so that we can be saved. And his blood will only benefit, benefit us if we respond. If we merely trust in something he did and pay him lip service, then his shed blood is not going to save us. And to respond to Jesus may not look exactly the same for every rich person uh, who, who repents, but it's always going to be radical. Jesus' sacrifice for us was radical. Our response is always radical too, if it's the right response. It's going to make the people around us say, what in the world happened to that person? Have they lost their minds? What could cause this kind of a change? Right? You're, you're doing a 180. You're getting off of a wide path that lots of people go down or that lots of people want to go down, and you're getting onto a narrow path that only a few find. It's still the same for us today. How did the church respond to the sacrifice of Jesus that he made for us in the beginning? Did they... Did they just trust in what he did for us and, and then just make some moderate changes to their weekend schedule while they continued, for the most part, living as they had always lived? Not at all. Listen to this. Really listen to what's happening here. This is a passage from the book of Acts, chapter 4. Now the full number of those who believed were one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Wow. 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 It seems to me like the church took Jesus pretty pretty literally on his command to sell possessions and to give to the needy. And it's not necessarily that everyone in the early church sold their houses. It's obvious that some of them still own houses. There, there's a house they met in to pray for Peter when he was put in prison by Herod. Simon the Tanner owned a house, it seems, from Acts chapter 10. Peter was staying with him. Philip and his seven daughters, later on in Acts, they're living in a house. But it was clearly a normal part of the life of the church for wealthy people to come into the community, to sell a house or a property or something, and give the money to help those who are in need. And can you imagine what would happen if this became a normal part of the life of the church in the United States? 
if it was just a normal thing for wealthy people when they become Christians to sell a house or a piece of land or a second house or a car or or other valuable possessions or, or to close out a retirement fund and to use the money to help people? How much would we be able to help people across the world who have serious legitimate needs? And how much would we, we, we be able to help people in our communities here? And if we practice this kind of generosity and interdependence, nobody in the church would need health care. It would be a community unlike any other, just like the church in Acts. And how compelling would that be to the unbelieving people around us here in this country if they heard that this was going on? Do you think that maybe more of them would decide to follow Jesus if, if they saw that kind of miraculous power in their lives, in our lives? Or maybe what would happen is less people would come into the church because less people would, would be willing to pick up their cross and to, to become disciples of Jesus when they would see the cost. But the people who do come in would become the kind of disciples Jesus produced himself. But that miracle doesn't seem to be happening for us today very much. We're, we're nothing like the church of the apostles, and everyone knows it. The unbelievers, people who know anything at all about what Jesus taught and how he lived, they know it. It's obvious. It's not a secret. And my point in saying that isn't just to make us feel bad, although that, that could be a good thing. We, we should feel bad about this. We should get on our faces and beg God for his mercy for how far short we fall from the response Jesus deserves from us and from the example that God has given us in his, in his word, the response that we are very much capable of if we were willing. But making us feel bad isn't, isn't the big point here. The big point is to encourage us to do something. Do something. Look at how the primitive church responded to the grace of God and to the sacrifice Jesus made for us. And look how badly we have been derailed from that. Look how far we have fallen from that. Now, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do? Because we can do something about it, you know. That miracle can still happen for us, at least as individuals. If you decide to make a move on this, and if your church isn't willing to follow Jesus like this, it doesn't mean that you can't. And maybe if you do something like this, you'll start a wave of repentance and faith in your church community. It's not like we have to do things according to how our capitalist society would have us do things. We can go against the, the grain and live as citizens of Jesus' kingdom. We've been climbing the ladder here in countries like America, many of us. We have enrolled in the world's spiritually deadly upward mobility program. And now, as a good friend of mine has said, we've got to enroll in Jesus' soul-saving downward mobility program. Are we willing? Are we willing to take the plunge? The door is wide open. The invitation still stands. That camel isn't going to get through that tiny hole, but we can, by the miraculous grace of God, we can walk through that door into the kingdom. There's nothing holding us back at all except ourselves. That concludes this series on greed and wealth. May God bless you. Please reach out to me if you would like to talk about these things. And in the next episode, I'll begin to talk about the teaching of Jesus that, in my, in my experience, is the most difficult for many of us to wrap our minds around. Thank you so much for listening.